I'm Chris Wallace. The stage is set as President Trump and Kim Jong-un prepare to meet again. But will this week's second summit do anything to advance the denuclearization of North Korea? Chairman Kim and I have a very good relationship. I wouldn't be surprised to see something work out. We'll discuss the upcoming summit, the humanitarian showdown in Venezuela, and why the president has changed his mind about pulling all U.S. troops from Syria. When we sit down with the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, live only on Fox News Sunday. Then House Democrats moved to block the president's national emergency declaration. There is no emergency at the border. It's a mythology of the president, not a reality. We'll discuss the latest on the border wall and the 2020 presidential field's move to the left with Democratic Party Chair Tom Perez. Plus, President Trump's longtime fixer, Michael Cohen, is set to testify on Capitol Hill. We'll ask our Sunday panel about that and when special counsel Robert Mueller will release his final report. And our power player of the week, dotting millennials with a real world playbook. We have built a GPS for adulthood. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. We begin with breaking news. Fighting broke out along the border in Venezuela as troops loyal to disputed President Nicolas Maduro blocked opposition-backed opposition convoys attempting to bring humanitarian aid into the country. Several people died and some 300 were injured. The Trump administration condemned the violence. That's only one of the challenges President Trump faces this week. On Wednesday, he meets with North Korea's Kim Jong-un for a second summit, this time in Vietnam. In a moment, we'll speak with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo about North Korea, Venezuela, and other hot spots. But first, we want to get a preview of the Trump-Kim summit from Kristen Fisher, reporting live from Vietnam. Kristen. Well, Chris, the location of this summit is very symbolic. Just a few decades ago, Vietnam was at war with the United States. Now, it is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, all while retaining communist control. So President Trump is hoping to show North Korean leader Kim Jong-un that if he commits to denuclearization, then his country could enjoy the same kind of economic prosperity as Vietnam. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is on his way to Hanoi for his second summit in less than a year with President Donald Trump. Maduro's forces stood firm and stood by him. Is that a disappointment? Chris, the Venezuelan people are speaking loudly and clearly. They understand that Juan Guaido is the legitimate president of their country. Uh, we're supporting that. Uh, the Lima Group, the OAS, European countries all around the world have seen the devastation that's been wrought in Venezuela by this sick tyrant, Maduro, who's denying food to starving Venezuelans and medicine to sick Venezuelans, burning trucks with... Uh, this, this, this is the, the worst of the worst of a tyrant. I think the Venezuelan people are seeing that. We saw yesterday the military begin to see it as well. Some of this violence was clearly of these collectivos, these gangs, while uh, the military wasn't as certain they wanted to lean into this violence. We're very hopeful in the days and weeks and months ahead, uh, the Maduro regime will understand that the Venezuelan people have made its days numbered. In a statement at the end of yesterday, you said the United States will take action. What does that mean? We've already taken action, action to support the Venezuelan people, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, they have a duly elected interim president, Mr. Guaido. We're going to continue to support him. We'll continue. The American people have been most generous, providing a couple hundred tons of food, medicine, hygiene kits for the Venezuelan people. And then we'll continue to build out the global coalition to put, to put force behind the voice of the Venezuelan people. What's happened there is a tragedy. There were uh, five or six or eight killed yesterday, um, but there have been hundreds and hundreds killed from starvation over the past weeks and months. Millions of people having to flee their homes. Three million people have had to leave. Ten percent of the Venezuelan population. That, those are the actions of the American people and the Trump administration to support democracy in Venezuela. But no 
military force. We've said every option's on the table. We're going to do the things that need to be done to make sure that the Venezuelan people's voice, that democracy reigns, and that there's a brighter future for the people of Venezuela. All right, let's turn to the main order of business for you this week, and that is the Kim Trump summit in Vietnam starting on Wednesday. Before the Singapore summit last June, National Security Advisor John Bolton said, look, they have to give up their entire nuclear program before the U.S. does anything. And here you were just after the summit. Take a look. The complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of the Korea Peninsula is the only outcome that the United States will accept. Is that still President Trump's position going into this summit, complete denuclearization and no U.S. concessions before that? There's been no change in U.S. policy since the time I've been Secretary of State, and frankly, even before that, when I was CIA Director. Our objectives are clear. Our mission is clear. President Trump's also said this is going to take time. There may have to be another summit. We may not get everything done uh, this week. We hope we'll make a substantial step along the way. I've, I've spent a lot of time with Chairman Kim. My team is on the ground today, continuing to flesh out uh, paths forward to develop a, a roadmap for a path forward between the two countries. We're determined to achieve that. It's important for the world's security. The UN Security Council has demanded, not the United States, but the UN Security Council has demanded that Chairman Kim give up these weapon systems it's in the best interest of the people of this country, and I hope we can make a real substantive step forward this week. It may not happen, but I hope that it will. Why a two-day summit? Might be one day. Might be two days. I'm confident that if it requires even more time, we'll commit to that. There, there have been lots of conversations. To dismantle the nuclear weapons that threaten our people and our allies in the region. We currently assess that North Korea will seek to retain its WMD capabilities. The question, I guess, is, as you head into the summit, has North Korea given any indication it's willing now to put meat on the bones, that it's either going to turn over an inventory of its arsenal or begin to turn over some of its nuclear arsenal? In June of last year in Singapore, Chairman Kim unequivocally, unequivocally stated, that he would denuclearize his country. But he has there were other but he pillars, hasn't. There were other pillars that we committed to as well. We've made progress along some, less so on others. Uh, this is a complicated process. It, uh, the, the history is right. I was a CIA director at 1.2, you'll recall, Chris. The history is difficult. The previous administration's policy, right, which was a test, allow the North Koreans to test, pray, pray they'd stop, and then cower when they threatened us, right, test, pray, and cower has been upended by President Trump. We've put real economic pressure on the North Koreans. We've built out a global coalition. One of the critiques is that we go it alone. We've built out the world's coalition to communicate to Chairman Kim that now is the time, now is the moment, and I hope we'll make real progress on that this week. There is criticism that President Trump is unrealistic about his relationship and the threat coming from North Korea. I want to make a couple of points about this. After Singapore, the president tweeted this, there is no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. And he talks repeatedly about the strength of his relationship with Kim. Take a look here. And we'll go back and forth, and then we fell in love, okay? No, really, he wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. Why does the president say that? Relationships matter, Chris. They affect everything in our lives, <laughs> whether it's grand strategy and denuclearization or simpler things. Uh, relationships absolutely matter. It's important that the two leaders are able to effectively communicate. I've observed this over the past uh, weeks and months. I've watched them uh, exchange messages. I've watched our team understand the messages that the two leaders have provided. And now we're going to get to have a second summit uh, where the two leaders can sit and have a frank, candid discussion, explore options, and I hope achieve what the ultimate end state is. Uh, creating a brighter future for North Korea and reducing the threat to the United States from the nuclear weapons that are today in North Korea. Is president, from pre President Trump's point of view, is the idea of formally ending the Korean War, which we had an armistice back in the 50s, or the idea of pulling some U.S. troops out of 
South Korea. Are either of those on the table for this summit? I told you before we started that, Chris, I'm not going to talk about the context of the discussions or elements of the negotiation. I'm, I'm simply going to stay away from that. When we have an announcement, you'll, you'll be among the first to know. <laughs> well, along with everybody else in the world. I, I, I'm going to ask you a slightly odd question, but it's something we're going to discuss later on in the show. While you're sitting down with Kim, the House Oversight Committee is going to be conducting a public hearing on television with Michael Cohen, the president's former lawyer and fixer. Reportedly, he's going to talk about all kinds of bad or questionable things done in the Trump organization. Do you question the appropriateness of having that hearing, holding a public hearing that potentially could undercut the president while the president is on foreign soil negotiating? Congress has its own authority. They can they can move how they choose to proceed. I know what we'll be focused on. I'm very confident that the president and our team will be focused on the singular objective that we're headed to Hanoi for. This week, the president reversed course on Syria. In December, he said that he was going to pull all 2,500 U.S. troops out of northeastern Syria right away. Take a look. We have won against ISIS. We've beaten them, and we've beaten them badly. Our boys, our young women, our men, they're all coming back, and they're coming back now. But now it turns out they aren't coming back now. He announced on Friday that he's going to keep 400 troops there, including 200 on the border with, with Turkey. Two questions, really. Has he now accepted the prevailing view in the military that even if they lose all their territory, that ISIS will remain a threat and secondly have you gotten any buy-in now that we're staying there from britain or france that they will keep troops there on the border to help protect our kurdish allies well chris the predicate of your question i think is is wrong so let me just try and address the policy there the president's made very clear uh, that the achievement of destroying the caliphate both in syria and in iraq we forget Mosul, people forget Raqqa. Uh, this is an enormous accomplishment of this administration and our partners in the region, and we're very proud of that. Uh, millions of people liberated from the terror of ISIS. Uh, President's also been very clear that this is a, the threat from radical Islamic terrorism is real. It continues, and we've got to continue to fight it. The the announcement this week that we're still going to have a um, a residual footprint inside of Syria makes sense in the context of our mission statement, and the tactics will change as time goes on. We'll uh, use different tactics in different parts of the world to fight back against radical Islamic terrorism. President Trump's committed to doing have that. Have Britain and France agreed to keep troops there now? Very hopeful that we will have a coalition there. Uh, I don't have anything to announce this morning, but I, I believe that uh, the Europeans will understand the risk and the threat and be partners alongside of us on this. I got about a minute left. I want to ask you one final question. Hoda Muthana, the young woman who left the United States four years ago to join ISIS uh, says that she wants to return here to face justice. You have said she's not an American citizen. She will not be allowed in. Uh, she was born in the United States. She did have a U.S. passport. And in the past, I other ISIS fighters, men who we have captured, have been brought back here to face justice. Look, nobody has any sympathy for Hoda Muthana, but I guess the question is, why is her case different? Why not allow her to come back in if she was born in the U.S. and has a passport and face justice here? She's a non-citizen terrorist. She has no legal basis for a claim of U.S. citizenship. She's not coming back to the United States to create the risk that someday she'd return to the battlefield and continue to put at risk American people, American kids, American boys and girls that were sent to help defeat ISIS. She put them at risk. She's not a U.S. citizen. She's not coming back. Even though she was born in the U.S.? Is the issue, I'm just trying to get, understand the issue. Is the issue that her father was a diplomat at the time? Because they say he had stopped being a diplomat before she was born. So there's litigation ongoing. Here's what I can tell you. We have a strong legal basis for our claim that she's not the citizen, and she's not coming back. Secretary Pompeo, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank Safe you travels and you, good luck in Vietnam. Thank you very much. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss the fight for power in Venezuela. Plus, what should we expect from the Trump-Kim summit this week? Will North Korea start to give up its time now for our Sunday group? GOP strategist Carl Rove, columnist for The Hill, Juan Williams, Julie Pace, Washington bureau chief for the Associated Press, and Josh Holmes, Senator Mitch McConnell's former chief of staff. Well, Carl, where are we at the end of a tumultuous Saturday? Is Maduro's hold on power stronger or weaker? Uh, I'd say weaker. Um, and every day, the steady application of the force of the Lima Group in the United States 
uh, it will make him weaker because inside the country uh, hundreds of thousands of people are taking to the streets or um, protesting at the border crossing points and there was Maduro as uh, his as his military forces killed protesters dancing on a stage in front of a captive crowd in in, uh, in, in Caracas. So, no, I think I think he is weaker today and every day that the United States and its allies. What's interesting to me is this was led by the Lima Group. This was led by the Organization of American States. The president receives a phone call before he takes action from Justin Trudeau. This is multilateral action involving the United States and the steady application of force and the protests inside the country will bring Maduro down. But one, uh, the, the sad fact is, for people who would like to see Maduro out, that there had been a lot of talk that perhaps the military, the armed forces would turn on Maduro, would side with the people, would side with the opposition. That didn't happen. So what does the U.S. do now? And how does President Trump and his administration and the U.S. avoid the image that once again, here's the U.S. intervening in Latin America, which has happened dozens of times over the last century? And not to good result. We don't have a great track record of successful intervention. So many unintended consequences, so much resentments against the U.S. Um, you know, to me, Maduro is a vulgar dictator. I think people are suffering. I think that that's why the humanitarian aid, why the Lima Group sees a necessity to get involved. But I thought you were on target in raising the question with Secretary Pompeo about U.S. military intervention. We can have CIA and other people go in there and try to undermine him. But at some point, I think the American people say, why is it our job? Uh, intervention in this area, as I said, has not, does not have a good track record. and. It also broaches the possibility that the U.S. would actually put military forces in to oust Maduro. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense with the public in terms of our foreign policy. It doesn't make sense. And, of course, it fits with the current push against all the charges of socialism that the Trump administration is uh, advancing here against their Democratic opponents. We'll be talking about that with Tom Perez in the next segment. Let's talk about the other big foreign policy story this week, as we just discussed with the Secretary of State, and that is that President Trump will be meeting with Kim Jong-un in Vietnam starting Wednesday for a second summit. Here's what the President had to say about that this week. We started off with a very good meeting, and I think we'll continue that along. I don't think this will be the last meeting by any chance, but I, I do think that uh, the relationship is very strong. Julie, how confident are U.S. officials that they're going to come out of this summit with something more than they came out of Singapore with, which were basically vague declarations of an intent to denuclearize? You hear two different things from, from U.S. officials. Uh, one, privately, they say that their expectations of some kind of significant deal are pretty low in this summit. Uh, there might be uh, more... Uh, talk about denuclearization, but the idea that they would come out with something signed specific with, with dates and verification is, is probably pretty low. But the other thing you do hear is that there is some concern that the president, because he knows that the takeaway from the first summit was that it was vague, that there wasn't anything particularly specific, that he could get in a room with Kim and make some type of concession uh, that goes against what his advisors want him to do, that he could be so eager to strike some kind of deal that he could give something up. Uh, I think that is a real concern particularly if you look at, and I know we'll talk about this a bit later, some of what will be happening uh, in Washington while he is abroad, uh, Michael Cohen, his former lawyer, who's going to be testifying, that he could be looking to direct attention in a different direction. Uh, Josh, what, what's your sense among Republicans, particularly Senate Republicans, particularly Senate foreign policy experts, uh, how do they feel about this summit and about giving Kim another big international platform, which always tends to weaken the sanctions regime? There are indications that Russia and China have loosened up in Singapore uh, and, and, and not getting a big concession from the North Koreans on specifics of denuclearization. Well, I think the important thing to focus on is to look at this as a continuum from when the president was first inaugurated. I don't think there was any question that we were perhaps even at the brink of war with North Korea. They were launching missiles indiscriminately, some of which uh, they were testing could hit the continental United States. Clearly, we could not ignore that. And so you basically have two paths at that point. You could uh, approach the brink of war or you could do what President Trump has been doing, which is engaging directly with Kim. And I think 
you know, no question, there has not been the concrete signed agreements out of the first uh, Singapore summit and probably won't be out of this. But, you know, what's not happening is they're not sending uh, missiles. They're not testing missiles. They're not uh, sort of broaching that brink of war type fever that we were at for the first year of his presidency. And I think that in and of itself is great progress. Carl, you're the one person at this table who's had some experience with this when you were <laughs> advising uh, President Bush 43. When he would head into a high stakes summit, how much did he and his team, all of you know, about what you already had baked in the cake, what you were going to get at the end of the summit? A, a lot. And, and that's one of the problems with our relationship with North Korea. We don't even have a common definition of what constitutes denuclearization. We don't have an agreement upon the process. What comes first, denuclearization or sanctions relief? And so they really are, they've had one summit, but let's not kid ourselves, we're at the beginning of a process. We're not in deep into the process. And uh, we're going to face an issue here where uh, what kind of concrete steps are the North Koreans going to take? Uh, yeah, sure, they're not sending missiles over, over, uh, over Japan and they're not testing nuclear weapons, but maybe they don't need to test. We, we know they've got operative nuclear weapons and we know they've got the ability to send missiles. Now, whether they can marry the two together, we don't know. But what concrete steps are we going to take? And one of the key things that I think people are looking at when I talk to people uh, in, in the foreign policy area is the, the facility Yongbyon, which is the only facility that from which they derive fissile material, uh, three elements that they need for uh, nuclear weapons. And the question is, the, the, the test of seriousness is whether or not they will decommission Young Bang and make, make it under an international uh, uh, inspection, inspection regime. regime. Yeah. But I have to tell you, I talked to a foreign policy expert this week who said, and I asked him specifically that issue, and he said, they've got enough fissile material already. Oh, sure. They don't need Young Beyond. They've already got Look, enough. They've bomb. got dozens of weapons. Let, let's not kid ourselves. If, even if we came to an agreement tomorrow <laughs> that they're not going to make any more, they have plenty of material, plenty of weapons. Uh, they will continue to use the material they have on hand to fabricate weapons in, in, unless, there's a, unless there's an agreement to stop. And even then, in a country that is a virtual slave state, how the heck do we have an inspection regime that works? You know, that's a very pessimistic view, but I must say, the, the, it raises the question in my mind, Carl, why are we giving this man a platform, an international platform, why are we legitimizing him? And don't forget that the Chinese and the Russians have often operated in such a way as to support this. Region. Well, you ask a question, I'll give you an answer. Real the, quick. The administration, I think, has made the determination that it is better to engage than to not engage. Now, mm -hmm. we can argue about that, but, but we, we, we engaged and it didn't work. We didn't engage and that didn't work. The president has so, so far done, done, gotten some things out of this, at least the hiatus not on the, okay. not what we're All right. Here. In any case, let's wait and see what happens Wednesday yeah. and Thursday <laughs> in Vietnam. All right. We have to take a break here. We'll see you all later in the program, but we want to move on because when we come back, Democratic Party Chair Tom Perez joins us to discuss President Trump's claims Democrats are going socialist. And we'll also discuss the party's effort to block the Trump declaration of a national emergency at the border. And see Chair Tom Perez about the party's move to the left and the fight over the president's national emergency. This week, self-described Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders jumped into the 2020 race, adding to a large and growing field of candidates who are taking the party further left. Joining us now, the chair of the Democratic National Committee, Tom Perez. Mr. Chairman, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Great to be with you, Chris. President Trump is pretty clear about at least one way he intends to go after the Democratic Party and whoever you nominate in 2020. Take a look. The Democrat Party has never been more outside of the mainstream. They're becoming the party of socialism, late-term abortion, open borders, and crime. Whether it's the Green New Deal or Medicare for All or suggestions about very high tax rates on the super wealthy, how do you defend against President Trump's charge and, and effort to, to portray the Democratic Party, your tax and spend policies, as socialist. This is one of the oldest tricks in the playbook, Chris. You go back 75 years when Republicans don't want to uh, discuss the issues that matter to real people. They call it socialism. Social Security, when it was being debated, you had Republicans calling it socialism. The minimum wage in 1938, you had Republicans calling it socialism. Medicare, Ronald Reagan said, and I quote, 
Medicare will lead to socialized medicine. Medicare will lead to socialism in America. The Affordable Care Act, the Children's Health Insurance in pro Program, all of those things were socialism, socialism. Why do they do that? Because they're wrong on the issues. They don't want to talk about pre-existing conditions. We're right on that issue. We want to make sure if you're diabetic, you can keep your coverage. They don't want to, so they change the subject. And okay. that's what they do. Some of those issues, climate change, health care, have been around for a while. But a new issue came up this past week. Three Democratic candidates for president now say they support reparations, compensating the descendants of slaves. Here they are. I have long thought that this country would be better off if we did find a way to do that. America has a history of 200 years of slavery. Mm -hmm. We had Jim Crow. And now Elizabeth Warren says she also supports reparations, not only for slavery, but for Native Americans. You talk about some of these other issues and say, well, the Republicans have always called them socialists. Back in 2016, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders all dismissed the idea of, of reparations. And polls have shown that the vast majority of Americans are against the idea. Are you comfortable with some of your leading Democratic candidates talking about reparations compensating the descendants of victims of slavery? Civil rights is the unfinished business of America, Chris, and we, we've seen throughout our nation's journey that we have more work to do. And that's why Democrats are talking about it. But what Democrats are talking most about right now is how do we build an economy that works for everyone and not just the few at the top? How do we make sure that if you have diabetes that we will bring down the cost of prescription drugs? How do we build an infrastructure program that's going to okay? I understand that, work? but that's specifically reparations. About. Do you think is that something that will be in the Democratic platform? The idea that we are going to pay the the country is going to pay reparations, compensation to the victims, the descendants of victims of slavery. That's something that'll be discussed during the course of the presidential nominating process, and what I what I think is going to be discussed uh, at at length during this nominating process is how do we make sure America works for everyone? I find it this the whole interesting thing about the continued use of the word socialism is that repressive socialist regimes Two of their most frequent qualities are, number one, they go after the press. They try to undermine the press. And number two, they, are, they have endemic corruption. And I find it very ironic when you hear this president using the word socialist all the time. I mean, he, Putin, uh, Kim, Castro, what they all have in common is they were doing so many of the same things. You shouldn't be attacking the press the way this president does. It's unprecedented. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be I, I, wait, I, I, got, I got to interrupt for a second. Are you putting the president in the same class with Putin and Kim and Castro? I'm just saying authoritarian socialist regimes undermine the media. That is wrong. You shouldn't do that. Period. No footnotes. No exceptions. Authoritarian socialist regimes have endemic corruption. You should understand that. We, Democrats won in 2018 in no small measure because of the culture of corruption engulfing this administration. You saw the clip that we played earlier where the president was going through the litany of things he says the Democratic Party has now become. One of the things that he talks about is the Democrats as the party of open borders. On Tuesday, the House Democrats are likely going to pass a resolution of disapproval against a declaration of a national emergency. Any concerns that the president is going to be able to paint Democrats as soft on border security. When you look at the facts, the facts belie that, Chris. The, the fact of the matter is that Democrats understand that you can have secure borders and the rule of law. That's what we have fought for. And as you correctly pointed out, I think in last Sunday's show, what this president has done is unprecedented. I think Mr. Miller was on this show. You correctly pointed out that there has been no factual circumstance where the president asked for X, Congress said no, and the president went ahead and did it. That's why the Heritage Foundation in 2011... I hate it when people that? turn my own words against me. Oh, well, 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 pl happened. well played, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay, let's turn to the Jussie Smollett case. After he claimed that he was the victim of a hate crime, Democrats rushed to his aid. 
uh, you tweeted, let's call it what it is, a vicious hate crime. Kirsten Gillibrand wrote, it's the latest of too many hate crimes against LGBTQ people and people of color. And both Cory Booker and Kamala Harris called it a modern day lynching. Here's how White House spokesperson Sarah Sanders responded to all of you. It's uh, another sad example of people so quick to want to attack uh, and come after this president, much like you saw with the Covington kids. Was this a rush to judgment and to play identity politics, uh, politics in an effort to attack the president? You know, Chris, I spent the better part of a decade under Republican and Democratic administrations as a career federal hate crimes prosecutor. I saw these cases firsthand. If the allegations that have come out in recent days are true, it's unconscionable because hate crimes, the fact of the matter, are on the rise. And when you, uh, when you create a, a false situation, you are doing an injustice to all the people who've been victimized. Look Do you at think the that you guys rushed too fast? To we had the facts. We, we acted on the facts as we knew at the time. And, and here are the facts that we know today. Hate crimes are on the rise. And in the aftermath of Charlottesville, frankly, that was a layup for the president. He should have un, unequivocally said there is no place for this. And yet he was empowering. He was giving permission. That was wrong. And, and we have to understand right now the fact of the matter, hate crimes are on the rise. And that should okay. be a bipartisan issue. Okay. Let me ask you about something that people would say would be a layup for you. Do you still feel that Virginia Governor Northam should step down for wearing blackface 35 years ago? And do you support the Virginia House of Delegates holding a public hearing where the two women accusing Justin Fairfax, the lieutenant governor of sexual assault, can testify? Well, let's take both questions right. together. Uh, I called for Governor Northam to step down. I think his ability to govern uh, has been compromised. As, as President Lincoln once said, uh, public sentiment is everything with it. You can do anything. Without it, you can't do so anything. So should he still step so down? I, yes, I've called for that, and I think his ability to govern has been undermined. And I have, I, have a, I have a concern in the context of having a part-time state legislature conducting the hearings. I have been unequivocal in making sure that when allegations of this nature are made, that they are investigated. I don't think the Virginia House of Delegates and the, and the Senate are the right place to investigate it. We should have an independent investigation that should be prompt, it should be thorough, it should be fair, and, and it, it, that's what should happen. Okay, I, I got about a minute left, I got some bookkeeping to do. Will <laughs> Milwaukee host the 2020 Democratic Convention? We have three finalists, Milwaukee, Houston, and Miami. Uh, they're all in the hunt. When are you gonna we're, do hoping, so? we're hoping to make the decision within uh, the next uh, a uh, few weeks at, at the most. I, my, my goal is to make it by the end of the month. I hope to keep that, but uh, my goal is to get it right. And if it takes a few days over, then uh, we're going to make sure we get it right. We have an embarrassment of riches, quite frankly. Finally, you have scheduled 12 Democratic debates, six this year, end of this right. year, six at the beginning of next year. Will Fox News get at least one of the 2020 Democratic presidential debates? We haven't made that decision yet. We have made the decision on the first two debates. And what we're doing in the first two debates, Chris, is unprecedented. Uh, two nights, uh, making sure we have random uh, draw. And, and here's our goal. You know what would also be unprecedented? Sure. Giving us a debate. Well, that's, well, we'll see about that. But uh, what, here's my number one goal. My number one goal is to make sure that everyone gets a fair shake. If we have 16 people in the race, 15 aren't going to make it to the mountaintop. My job is to make sure that everyone and their supporters uh, feels like their candidate got a fair shake. And then my other job is to make sure that whoever wins has an infrastructure uh, that will enable them to thrive. And that's why uh, I enjoy coming here, talking to you, talking to your viewers about our, our vision of a democratic party, of a nation, frankly, that works for everyone. Well, we welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us, Chairman Always Perez. Please come back, sir. My pleasure. Look forward to it. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group again to discuss a special counsel report, which will be wrapped up someday and president trump's former fixer on capitol hill this week plus what would you like to ask the panel about the timing of michael cohen's congressional hearing while the president is overseas just go to facebook or twitter at fox news sunday and we may use your question on the air president could be a russian asset 
I think it's possible. I think that's why we started our investigation. And I'm really anxious to see where Director Mueller concludes that. Former acting FBI director Andrew McCabe, like a lot of people, anxious to see what special counsel Robert Mueller has found in almost two years of investigation. And we're back now with the panel. Well, Julie, first of all, explain to our viewers and to me why we get all these reports last week. The Mueller report is coming out Friday. No, it's coming out this week. Then suddenly we hear, no, we don't know when it's coming out, but it's not going to be this week. And secondly, what do your sources in the White House say? How worried are they really about the Mueller report? So on the first point, I think what you're seeing is um, some uh, wishful thinking on people's parts. We've been living with the Mueller investigation for quite some time, and there are signs that it is uh, drawing to a conclusion, um, in part because uh, Mueller has handed off some of these investigations. Some people on his team are moving on to other jobs. But the reality is, you know, we're not going to know when this investigation is done until it is officially done, and Mueller tells uh, Barr, the new attorney general, that he's done. I think it's important to note that when that happens, uh, that actually kickstarts another process, which is to figure out what becomes public. So that is not actually the end of this. In terms of your second question, you know, there is some real anxiety in the administration about this report because it's just such an unknown. Uh, they are fairly confident that there's going to be nothing in the report that directly ties President Trump to Russia in terms of a phone call saying let's coordinate some type of real smoking gun. But there are other areas where they uh, have a lot less certainty that relates to the question of obstruction. Uh, around the firing of James Comey. Also, this Trump Tower meeting uh, that happened where Don Jr. was present there, anything that involves the president's family, his kids in particular, is of real concern. And again, it is such an unknown. They, they think they know what Mueller has based on conversations with lawyers who have represented people who have had conversations, uh, but, it, but it remains a, a bit of a black box for them. Well, I want to I wanna pick up with the, the, one of the first points you made, which is after Mueller gives up his report, he gives it to William Barr, the new attorney general, and according to the regulations, that is a confidential report, which Barr then has to decide how much to turn over to Congress and to the public. Here's what Barr said at his confirmation hearing. I am going to try to get the information out there cons consistent with these regulations, and to the extent I have discretion, I, I will exercise that discretion to do that. Carl, uh, the Justice Department generally does not say anything about people it doesn't decide to charge. The Comey press conference on Hillary Clinton being a, a pretty Larry, dramatic Larry an example of, a, not, following of, of not following that. But you've also got the fact that for the last two years, House Republicans, particularly in the Intel Committee, were pressing, pressing the FBI to turn over a lot of information it didn't like, the FISA warrant. Isn't it going to be a little hard now to turn off that spigot if House Republicans or Barr or the president said, oh, no, we can't share this information? Yeah, look, that's going to be the big battle, what's made public and what's not made public. And this rule was promulgated by Janet Reno after the expiration of the independent counsel statute in 1999. It's been in force ever since. And I'd make the argument this. I, I thought it was absolutely dreadful. It was a sancti the sanctimonious Jim Comey blasting Hillary Clinton after, after him declining to indict her. He had no authority to make that decision, incidentally. That was a decision that should have been made at DOJ. But having made that decision, taken unto himself the power to do that, the then deciding not to indict her and then trashing her was it was bad for the, this is several hundred years of American All right, but look, but look, 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 if, so, but let me that, just ask you. No, let me yeah. just ask you this. So. According to the Justice Department legal guidelines, they can't indict a president. So the only person who could bring a president, I'm not saying right, that there's right. anything to do, right. is Congress. Don't right. you have to share any well, information you with get, Congress? Well, you, you, you get to the critical moment. I sometimes you, you kind of do. Brilliantly. I mean, <laughs> brilliantly. But, but the, that is the key question. If they, if, they de if they decline to indict the president because presidents should not be indicted while they're in office, that's the one thing that might need to be made public because that would need to be taken into consideration by Congress, which holds the ultimate power of impeachment. But short of that, I don't think that they should make anything public because that's not what we should do in our system. Comey showed why that was okay. wrong. I, I, we're running out of time here, so I want to get to the, another subject, and that is Michael Cohen, the president's former fixer, former lawyer, is going to testify in public before the House Oversight Committee on Wednesday, this very day that President Trump sits down with Kim Jong-un in Vietnam. We asked you for questions for the panel about that, and Barry Zalma tweeted this, why does the Congress have no respect for the president? 
Josh, how do you answer, Barry, about the decision by the House Oversight Committee to hold a hearing with Michael Cohen, who's clearly going to say bad things about the president, right in the middle of a summit? Well, I think it's terrible, and I think it's a terrible precedent. I mean, there used to be, not so long ago, this agreement when a president was overseas that you help you hold fire on domestic uh, political disputes. This one is absolutely the highest rung on the ladder of a political dispute. We're talking about a former aide to Mr. Trump who, who has proved and time and again is very interested in trying to harm him politically just at a moment when the president is sitting down for something that can only be described as a, of top national interest for the international security of our country. So I think it's absolutely ridiculous. One point I wanted to make um, in reference to whether this is public or not, um, we're not dealing with an intern escapade here as we were in the 90s with the Star Report. We're dealing with some sensitive information about a state actor of Russia uh, uh, interfering, the report. In, interfering with election. There is definitely Definitely going to be some things that are redacted here. I absolutely am confident the Democrats will use that as an opportunity to say that the DOJ is not sharing everything. But in the end, I think we're going to know everything that we need to know in this Mueller report. But by law, wait, wait, wait. Let me let me bring in one. And you've been pretty critical. I think it's fair to say of this president. Do you have any problems with a House committee holding a hearing, a public hearing on national television with Michael Cohen?